How's it going? It's going very well. Yeah? I'm excited to talk about some of these interesting ideas. These ideas we've talked about many times and we're just committing them to tape, so that'll be good. It would be. Um, I think uh, some of the most kind of like different things that we're trying to think about are trying mm. to combine lots of um, things which are getting popular nowadays, yep. like the podcast idea. Yep. Um, and then combining it with something which is another popular um, yeah. way of learning, which is the masterclass idea. Yep. Um, and we want to find a way to get the best of both worlds, I guess. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that idea, the concept, and how, yeah. how we're going to go about it. Okay. Um, well, it struck me that uh, there was some very, very, very beneficial effects of having a conversational approach to learning. Mm -hmm. um, the podcast did it really well. And I enjoy listening to podcasts in a way that I don't really enjoy when it's just one person talking, right? Yep. Audible, I listen to audiobooks, but it's not the same. There's something magic about the conversations. Maybe it's the fact that they are more spontaneous. Maybe it's the fact that they're, it's just more of a natural way to, to engage with people because it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that, that that has worked really well. And the market agrees don't they because podcasts became they were super popular for about two years in 2005 2006 really yeah really popular and then Not completely disappeared yeah completely disappeared. i had something called podomatic which was a podcast service back in 2005 when i came back from hong kong i really got into it but it just disappeared and then it came mm. back again why do you think it came back what brought it back it's weird right because we it's like technology advanced yeah. videos got better and better and better um, and yet we are like kind of switching back to audio. Um, what do you think? I, I, I find that um, one of the things that I, one of the ways I listen to the podcast is during my com commutes. Of course. Um, I'm continuously out and about and I, I really don't have the, the ability to even put, a, put my mobile phone in front of me. So I just prefer yep. just, you know, putting something in my ear and just walking, yep. running, doing whatever I want to do. Uh, and it's super convenient like that. There is something I used to mention, the kind of natural part of it that it's a conversation rather than actual you know yeah it's not scripted yeah or it's yep. just has, it's mostly guided not not scripted at all is that a good thing or a bad thing good question um do you when you do your podcast how do you because like you know the tomato timer is going very well <laughs> it's good fun you enjoy it but how do you structure it and what are you trying to achieve when you structure your podcast i think i just want to find out the story yeah. i, I want to ask the right questions i want to find out i just want to create the environment for my guests to kind of share their most yeah. intimate details, thoughts um, and insights, I guess. So make them super relaxed and they can just do their thing. Mm. Yeah. OK. So what do you prepare in advance? Cause some people do an awful lot of preparation, don't they, for yeah. podcasts? Read, they read books, yeah. they research people and they do all that sort of stuff. What, what do you tend to do? Not much, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I do. <laughs> we, to yeah. this. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> we do like the, the best part about yeah. it is like the community kind of sending in, the, sending in their own questions. Right. That's super helpful. That yeah, really course. guides the conversation and it allows the kind of the community to drive the, the structure, the, the, yeah. the format and even the main topics which are discussed. Mm. But really, like I'm not uh, other than the initial kind of uh, introduction that we have, we, we have a little chat before the kind of the green room, I guess that's what yes. it's called. Yeah. And do you say I'm going to talk to you yeah. about this? And kind this of, we just have like thing. a yeah. Yeah. basic framework, yeah. but mostly it's just like, you know, let's go in. Sometimes yeah. something we plan to get in the conversation doesn't happen. Yeah. And sometimes something incredible, like we, yeah. we, we had no idea this was going to be part of the topic, um, just uncovers. What's been the most surprising thing about doing podcasts, interviewing people? So, so much fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think I was a super like confident and uh, articulate person just out of the box. You know, yeah. I, I thought I needed a lot of all of my scripts, uh, all of my speeches, even in that CLC, I would, I would have like a proper script and I'd stand yep. in front and I'd, I'd read it out word for word. Um, but surprisingly, podcasts have helped me develop in confidence. Yes. But also um, made me realize that the, this, this kind of natural conversational way of, of teaching, of explaining, of bringing out stories yep. is just so, so much fun. I think people focus on the wrong things. I remember watching a video, a very good friend of mine, who I won't mention by name, of course. Okay. You never know who's going to watch this. But he sent me a video of something he'd done for marketing. 
and he absolutely nailed it. It was perfect in terms of everything apart mm -hmm. from the energy. <laughs> well, <that's> a... <laughs> so he'd got the words absolutely bang on. He might have spent a day doing this. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, this sounds like it's coming from a dead man. It just sounds like so unengaging, so boring. I, I couldn't even watch it. I mean, I, I did watch it because it's a friend of mine. And it's difficult. You don't know what, what you want to say is, don't worry about the, getting the words precise, getting the words completely accurate. Don't worry about the odd mistake. What you want is mm. the energy because yeah. that's what is real and that's what connects with people. Of course, you don't want the opposite end of the spectrum, which is lots of Super, ums yeah. and ahs and... Um, that's not fun. Um, uh, it's horrible to listen to, yeah. especially if it's over and over again, right? Of course. We edit those out most of the time. Right? So you won't <laughs> um, hear any on this well, one. Well, <laughs> you might. You might. Um, so well, yeah, I don't know. So for me, it's all about energy. And I think that why I, why I like podcasts is I think it's the energy of the conversation that comes comes out. And I like the, po the, you know, the podcasts I like best where there's a bit of obviously off script. They're obviously having a conversation mm -hmm. and they don't quite plan it and they're challenging each other. But I don't like challenging in the sort of, I'm just going to push back on yeah, you yeah, on yeah. this or call you out on that. I don't Not really argumentative. like that. What More I like, like is, okay, constructive. Explore, exploratory, explorative, dialectic, yeah. which is we've got an honest, earnest uh, intention to try and come up with something that we, we discover together mm. rather than I'm going to try and put my point across and any rebuttal that you, I'm going to try and crush you. Crush, yeah. yeah. Destroy you, eviscerate you. Yeah. Well, you okay. said something um, around the kind of to not. Yes, we do do the ums and ahs. We put filler words in. We make mistakes. We yeah. use the wrong words completely sometimes. Yeah. I I know I pronounce some words incorrectly. Yeah. And I, just thinking back, so many of my episodes have absolutely unstructured <laughs> sentences. Yeah. My English yeah, is exactly. all over the place. But it's fine. Yeah. As long as the yeah. overall meaning is is getting through it, it's, it it yeah. feels okay. And yeah. I I feel more comfortable, you know, just making mistakes because. That's, that's natural, you know, you always do make mistakes in a conversation. You're not word for word, you're not writing a book. And what's the best bit? What engages with humans most is like the bloopers, mm. right? So when you of do course, the yes. conversation, you say, oh no. As long as it, you're not doing it over and over again, and it isn't, but some yeah. of the outtakes are some of the funniest things ever. They are. And connect with. So I want to focus back on learning and yep. teaching and using this style, this, this yep. methodology. Is it a new methodology? I, I wonder because uh, thinking back to some of my best teachers, they were very, very good. Yep. explainers and very yep. good storytellers yep. they would stand in front of the board yep. without writing on the board but just share explain in a conversational manner engage with students as they discuss those things and that was the best kind of learning I had yep. so are we actually doing something new or are we just kind of like bringing back what really does work it's always a good question um, to think you know and, and, and part of my brain always I always want to be doing something new. of course I always want to be pioneering and so I immediately reject the sense that w my ideas are not something new yeah. and incredible of course like all of us we feel this kind of this pride but i always go back to mozart and uh when he's writing he didn't invent any new notes right he no. just put the same notes together in a different order that was better and i think that's what we're doing we're saying that you've got the expertise which might be an individual teacher mm -hmm. it might be a master class format they've got that expertise and then you've got something that you don't have in a typical lesson, even in a school. You don't have someone else who is a bridge, a facilitator, someone who knows enough. They've done their preparation in the, in the research, mm -hmm. in the topic area of the, of the guest, to know enough to be a really effective bridge between the, the wisdom of the expert mm -hmm. and the audience. And in some ways, my, my brother Charlie, who runs Evidence-Based Wisdom, or On Wisdom is the podcast, and he says, what you are is you're the voice for the audience. And that's yeah. why people like podcasts, because the audience feel like they're being represented in the conversation. I gotcha. Think. It's, it's, we are part of the conversation. Yep. And a podcast allows us to feel that rather than a, a video tutorial, which is more like I am presenting to you, yep. I'm, I'm giving you information. This feels more like I'm part of the conversation. Um, and the host, the best kind of hosts are always those who make you feel like your voice is being represented, I yes. guess. And, and, in addition to that, a really good facilitator host will know where the public or the audience or the target audience might be getting a bit lost, mm -hmm. where they might be getting a bit bored, why in a particular area that a domain expert might be just going way too deep into something. And then you or, say, yeah. okay, so what I'm understanding from this is this. So a really good host says, okay, so what you, what I think you mean by that, is that correct? And restating, rephrasing, replaying it back to the expert to make sure that we, that we get it. And I suppose the only addition is 
to, because you could say, well, are you not just doing podcasts? Well, no, because what we're trying to do with the Mastercast format is to, to really take a specific, valuable and meaningful piece of, of wisdom, of experience, and delivering it in a format that will have visuals as well, because mm. it, will, it will need it. Of course. Let's, let's be honest, there's very few things that you can do and feel comfortable being examinable in without actually having a sense of how it works visually. Yeah. Right? You yeah. can't really learn maths in a podcast. Not really, no. Not on its own. Not on its own. But yeah. if you could have a conversation about this and where these theorems came from, and, and I mean, it'd be interesting to see. I don't know how many podcasts are really good for uh, the, the explaining how to do stuff in maths. I mean, there's lots of ones about the interesting factor. Yeah. I don't know your experience of math podcasts. Is it, not much. To was be it a thing? Was it a thing? <laughs> is it a thing? Probably is, yeah. but um, <laughs> not not really into. There'll it. be someone doing it, won't there? I'm sure. So, one of the things that comes to mind, Zubair, is how we go and how Z notes and all the things that you've done can be part of the journey, which takes people from just being consumers of of someone else's information, someone else's knowledge, to actually being really properly good at learning itself and that's something that we both share a, a real keen interest in what what do you think of the in your experience of being a student a lot more recently than me yeah. you know what are the what are the challenges what are the barriers what are the steps that we can take to sort of move people on, on along this journey i guess i i'll just kind of like think retrospectively and think about even more recent, even like a little bit further back, I think A level time was a better, or GCSEs yeah. were a better time than university because things change a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, the, the <laughs> it's almost counterintuitive, especially yeah. like with my philosophy of learning, which is all about you know learning through conversations and community, um, learning by doing, and sometimes with Zenotes it feels like you know we're giving so much content, we're giving the best possible resources. What are the students meant to do? So I think it's a good point to clarify yeah. by what, what, I, what I foresee or what I envision you know, is to be for a student, which is more of a, a canon, a framework, a, almost like a checklist, yeah. a filled out checklist for you to know exactly what is required yeah. for you in that certain syllabus. At the end of the day, we do need to set an exam. Yeah. We do need to be satisfying a certain number of syllabus checkpoints. Yeah. So, we need some sort of, some form of resource that provides us with that. But I highly discourage to use just the notes as, as, a, as a means to read and, and kind of memorize or learn by, you know, by rote or whatever. So the first thing that I think is important when, when it comes to using resources from Xenos, but not just um, in general during your A-levels, is, is about kind of processing information. There, is, there are textbooks, there's what's happening in your lessons, it's coming back, uh, it's doing those exercises, it's doing past paper questions. You need a way to find, to process all this like disparate pieces of information. And I think uh, that's what I, what I, what I, what's the first step yeah. uh, for learning. Processing the information. Yeah. You've got these inputs, and then, then you've got this processing, and then you're capable of delivering outputs in some format, yeah. Okay. I think so. And then, obviously, as you go through this processing bit, you most cases the simpler pieces of concepts should be able to should be understandable immediately and so that's all right there will definitely be stuff which makes absolutely no sense and that's okay too but it means that it requires more processing it requires more input it requires more uh, more time essentially you need to spend more time to think about it to really unfold it in your mind so that that it makes complete clear sense to you in your head and it's important for you to for it to happen in your head rather than in in, in a certain way of notes, because yep. you're not gonna go into the exam and copy down bullet points. You need to form information and you need to be able to, what if the question doesn't come exactly like what was in the previous question that you did? You have to be able to work on the, on the spot and, and try to be able to work it out. Um, and without having understood it deeply enough, you, you, will, you will not be able to do that. Okay, so I'm a 16 year old kid. I don't have a lot of time. I'm doing eight and nine subjects can't really be asked, can't really be bothered to do all this processing. I'm just going to learn stuff. What's, you know, a lot of people in the Zenex community and a lot of people all over the world just say, I just want to learn it. I mean, I don't really care because I can get good results by just memorizing. So 
how do you how do we respond as yeah. as educators to that well i have to say i can't remember the name of the book that that memory book do you remember that you recommended to me yeah. moonwalking with einstein oh yeah that's it right <laughs> yeah we, we, i was just messing yeah. moonwalking with einstein yes yeah. it's good um, and it was incredibly insightful for me because i'm always someone who's discouraged memorizing yeah. in in its art oh, well, not before we say it's art in that in that kind of yeah uh, as as a kind of a, a freak show type thing or as a as a superhuman thing just yeah. the art of memory it's like yeah. Mm, okay yeah and i think that that book really unlocked a lot of stuff for me and it made me realize that memorizing itself isn't the negative part of our educational system yeah. that is still a hugely important skill you can't sit with your doctor and he'll be like yeah one moment let me just yeah. check that definition for you yeah that won't work you need to have things at the tip of your fingers um so I I'm not when I talk about rote learning I'm not talking about like discouraging memorization because it's an important skill. You need to be able to recall stuff. There needs to be stuff in your if you think about your yeah. your brain as like a, a hard drive, you know, you need to have some stuff which is really super accessible and that's only going to happen if it's in your memory. Um but then there's another aspect of things which is about being able to then use that information in a meaningful way. So I think things like definitions, yeah. you know, key key glossary terms i guess we we yeah. call it uh with the glossary at the back of a book right sure. um those things do need to be in the in your mind in some way and by memorizing some in many cases and i do this a lot for my math exams i would i would actually write down theorems over and over again until the 7th or 8th time i wrote it down I'm like whoa it makes sense now yeah. because it yeah. sometimes you do need that kind of continuous almost like a hitting a rock over and over and over again until it kind of like oh wow it makes sense now um I'm taking a bit of a tangent so I'll I'll come back a little back a little well, further. I, I mean you you're talking about memory which mm. um I think we should we should spin off to talk about memory at some point. Of course. Sure. But um yeah. But the 16 year old, yeah. Yep. He's saying that why not just learn and by learn I'm yeah. I'm essentially memorize. taking memorize um and get through these exams. Sure. It's in some cases it might work. It's doable. Yeah. But honestly I think to memorize the the depth of information the amount of information across 8 or 9 GCSE subjects is actually the more work or similar amount of work to actually do it properly anyway uh you just need to be more efficient with your time um so part of this part of your kind of learning i guess plan or or your your journey through this kind of these examinations should be to spend time when you're learning at school to spend a bit more time to make sure that you actually get what's happening it might take 30 minutes more but yeah. doing that will actually lead you to not fall behind in the next lesson because that's going to be connected to the, the next one yeah. especially with something like math so uh, Fr front loading as much as possible isn't it sort of go, but most people won't do that and i'm one of those most people in that i would always say i can always learn this later i won't but you know just i just ask about it in lessons chat have some fun and then i know that i could learn it later on mm -hmm. and absolutely when i compare myself with people who got much much better results in much less time it was the front loaders but these were people and my my two elder sons are a great example of this they get to lectures early, early kind of do a blank sheet exercise to work out roughly what they know about this topic already do the lecture at the end of the lecture they kind of do another one to work out what they've actually learned and any gaps and that sort of stuff and then then that's working for them all that time rather than my brain when i was doing stuff go go to lectures or don't go to lectures then you get to the exams and then cram for like a week a yeah. month or whatever none of none of my brain's activity for the several months in between lecture and examination it's not it's not working for me yeah. it's thinking about other things yeah. so so but how do we get that across to people because but may, maybe like let me just yeah. throw the that back to you like do those things that you crammed in the last minute do they did they actually stick past those you know 10 15 20 days worth of examination of course not i mean probably a week after i've done the exams but then if if you're studying to just pass exams why do we need to learn why do we need to be able to remember things i learned how to learn mm -hmm. i learned how to learn i learned how to memorize stuff very very quickly and i learned how to learn much later when i went to university but um rather than at school but so so i suppose the thing is is it really more efficient to actually can you get better results by just carrying the buckets of water to your village or do you really get better results by building the pipeline yeah. given the amount of resources required yeah. to learn how to build the pipeline and that sort of stuff yeah. rather than just carry the water yeah. what do we think 
I don't know. I mean, what the, the question is, what we want is we want people to see the value of the pipeline, not just for this exam, because exactly. if they then have it for the next and for the next and, and for anything that they want to learn later on in life. Yeah. So I think um, a, a story for me is that when I, this is some, something that's super clear when you get to university. Yeah. Um, I would say school exams are still quite easy to hack. It's easy to get an A star or an A or even you know, pass those exams without deeply learning, understanding something. But when you get to university, and I think even further than that, when you get to work, you really get tested because you're not going to have a, you're not going to have something to memorize and then go to your boss to tell them. Uh, you're not going to, and even my final math exams were like crazy hard. You know, they, my brain, uh, I don't know how, even how I, X plus Y, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but but it was at that time where the differentiation happens. I know not many people want to take the university path. Maybe people are going to be like entrepreneurs. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to work for anyone. The ability to learn, yeah. you know, as you said, learn to learn, um, and the ability to retain information, process information, the ability to build that pipe, yeah. pipeline from the village yeah. to the yeah. to the well, um, will always be important. You can never circumvent that if you don't do it at the age of 15, 16, if you don't do it at the age of 21, when you're doing your final year exams, yeah. you're still going to need it at some point in your life. And it's not, it might not be for a certain exam, it might not be for uh, a certain apprenticeship or an interview, it might be for a real life process in your life, you know, you might be um, <laughs> building a home or you might be uh, figuring out where, where you want to travel next and you'll still need to be able to research, gather information, process it, make a decision and those key skills of, yeah. will, will always be important for you. Do you think we should do a better job teaching people younger when they're learning things and they're more natural. Should we try and do much less content in schools and much more yeah. learning how to learn? Question, well, just a question, I have no agenda on this. I wanna just maybe talk a little bit more about project-based learning when, when it comes to that because that's the kind of, I don't think it's the, the other option, but it definitely is an alternative, right? Uh -huh. um, if you're not working towards syllabus content and if you're not yeah. working towards ticking off a checklist, you can be learning through projects. In your mind, how would you define that? You know, in your sphere of sort of awareness, what what would you define as a project, for example? Um, yeah, I, I want to. I guess I'm taking, picking up lots of stories from uni. When my friend studied engineering, yeah. and he had those these really cool projects where um, the engineers, the computer scientists, the business people, they would all form a team, yeah. and they'd work on a project together. And the, his final year project was about designing a an electric race car okay. from scratch yeah. and to go from like designing the battery designing the prototype the the aerodynamics but also thinking about how we're going to be able to and afford it and, and build it functional teams so yeah and so you've got the business side of things yeah. and then you've also got the how do you program it so that it has these kind yeah. of certain features and, and awareness and whatever um that's what i thought was a yeah. was an amazing example yeah. of a project-based learning activity and they probably learned a lot more didn't they about? i would imagine so and i feel like um you take a lot more ownership when you're when you're in a project-based learning environment. Um, what are the challenges with it? Because um, project-based learning is yeah. obviously better mm. because it's how you learn in real life. So there must be some problems with it. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, you know, everyone will be doing it, yeah. right? The two key problems I see: number one, if it's a group work activity, you'll always find the one person who's not going to work. You'll always find the people who the, the other group of people who are, who work a little bit, and you'll always have someone who has yeah. to work night and day to get that yeah. project so a lot across the finish line. Or a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So okay. number one is because of the kind of the the group style learning, you tend to not... Uh, it's not equitable in its... Sometimes. In its awards or... And number two is it's, it's difficult to to construct as an, as an educator, as a, as a yeah. teacher, to come up with an innovative project which hasn't been done before, so you can't just go up and copy paste something which is interesting enough to engage students, which has a certain components, which lots of different groups of students can, that lots of different students with different qualities, you know, yeah. not just qualities, but like learning abilities and, and, and different talents can engage with in, in their own way. It, it comes down, from my perspective, it comes down to what's easy for teachers to administer. Mm. 
compared to what's valuable for the student. And I'm not sort of having a go at the education system in general. Um, that'll come later. <laughs> uh, but, but I'm saying you've got to, when, if we're design thinkers and we're trying to design mm -hmm. environments, contexts, scenarios in which students can become better learners and more effective learners, yeah. then we have to make it better for everybody and simpler and more cost effective for everybody to do it. Or there's going to be some resistance. I mean, there aren't any teachers in the world who are right now saying, you know what? I'm pretty much not doing anything that hard at the moment. I'd quite like some extra work, if you don't mind. You know, I don't, I've never heard a teacher say, I'm getting paid too much or I don't have enough work. Now, you could argue that about lots of people, but I know what it's like as a teacher, and it's brutal. The first two, three years of teaching, it's brutal. It's ridiculous, especially if you're working in the state sector in the UK. It's really hard work because you've got all the behavioral and the classroom management all that sort of stuff as well as learning your craft it's really hard work and then what tends to happen is you get well we you aside from aso yeah <laughs> aside from all the, the the assessment issues and keeping on top of things once you've sort of learned your craft you then either decide well teaching's not really for me because i'm sort of burnt out and we'd lose a lot of great people or we go, well, the only way to progress through this is not by becoming better and better and better at kids learning. It's becoming better and better at the administration side of things. Yeah. So you progress through the, through the organization because you want a bigger house. You want to be able to afford a family and, and, a, and a car and these things. So you want to go, well, up through the organization and you end up doing less and less, really focusing on the real nuts and bolts of learning. So if we're designing something, which we are, it has to involve something which is a solution, not just for the learner, but for the administrators as well, right? Yeah. So how are we going to do that? I guess that's where my vision lies, yeah. where when I talk about community-led learning, um, it's, still, it's still, you know, in its most earliest forms, you know, the community which is leading the learning are the small group of students who have contributed to the platform. In the next iteration, we have some ideas where we're asking the whole Xenos user group to be able to contribute something to the platform. But really when learning happens in its finest forms is when groups of students organize themselves yeah. um, almost like cells, you know, build it's together this, group. yeah, yeah and, and then they, they, they pick up a project, a task, uh, some sort of goal, and they work together. And when you have that kind of self-direction wow. initiative, group self-direction, well. group self -direction, yeah, so the, yeah. yeah people cohering around something that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, an objective which, which, yeah. which resonates with all of them. Yeah. That is the best kind of, um, that's, the, that's, that's one where teachers aren't involved at all, exactly. unless they, they're just like monitoring mostly, but it's, it's so, so much fun. It, for, for all parties, because the teacher is doing, yeah. learning is happening without them having to shove and knowledge down their throat. Students are enjoying it because they're forming groups with their friends and they're doing stuff in a way which makes sense to them, is enjoyable to them. And yeah, it, it just sounds like the you know, win-win solution. Now the irony is that happens by itself mm -hmm. when students like Gabriel, yeah. right? I was just going to take, take yeah. that example. So uh, I, I don't know all the details of it, but yeah, Gabriel was telling me about how he was, he had a, a game which was all about designing rocket ships. Yeah. Kerbal uh, Space Program, I think That's it. it is, yeah. I don't know anything about it, <laughs> but designing space rockets and it's a full-fledged full yeah. video game. Yeah. And then they used a community platform, Discord, to form a group of people, to form this kind of system where they were interacting with each other and they, they built NASA, they built lots of different companies yeah. and they, they pitched their designs to NASA. NASA approved them, provided investment. Yeah. They then went out to build that, sky, that rocket ship and tested it and depending on whether it worked out or not, it was amazing. I don't even know the details, but whatever he was telling me about was awesome. So he just, he just, no, no real interaction with these human beings that he was speaking to. A video game, which was never intended to be used in this way. He is sitting there learning about economics, learning about yeah. aerodynamics, Allocation learning about, learning about people. Learning it's, about it's just incredible. I was just blown away and I and loved they, it. They built it themselves and hacked it. It was their idea yeah. and it had zero, um, adult educator sort of perspective so so the question is this is that this is the kind of a natural way that people learn and want to learn anyway and and you can see how invigorated they get Absolutely. by it and how effective it is so it's like what the hell man what why are we trying to persist 
with another style of learning which is demonstrably inefficient mm -hmm. it engages kids in very little meaningful ways and leaves kids completely hating education by the end of those 16 18 years so it's almost like scratching your head so it's not like we have to invent something totally new and it's not like we have to train people to learn something new it is already something that they're naturally and spontaneously will do if they are provided with the internet connection and you know some basic sort of means of communication with each other they'll, they'll work it out I, I want take it back a little bit though we've, we've been quite critical of, of the educational system but i do have to say that you know, along the way, I've had some incredible teachers yeah. who have taken this approach. Yeah. And at an individual, you know, small 20 students group level, there are people who are doing some amazing stuff in education. Sure. Yeah. Um, I remember going to Finland a couple months back before this, the world went into pandemic. Yeah. Um, and it was just amazing watching this tiny village school, which, you know, it was yeah. middle of nowhere um, in the outer circles of the Arctic. Um, and there they were um, with this incredible school with a, you know, they had 3D printers and, uh, and a maker's society and whatever. Yeah. And there they had a, an allocated part of their day where they were just project based learning. So they had the teacher had to come up with a project and there's these students had built, I don't know, crates and, and, and I don't know, there were trucks and I don't, there was like this whole like they had, you know, where an assembly hall would usually happen. Instead of that, they just had a place displaying everything that they would built. And it was just like, whoa, this is mind blowing. These are like 12, 14 year old kids who had just uh, been given, I guess the tools, yeah. a little bit of guidance, but mostly given free reign about what they wanted to do and they were doing it. So is that good because it is much better than the way we're doing normal education? Or is that, I mean, what I'm trying to work out, is that just, like the best sort of way of doing things if we still have to send kids to school and we still have to have these infrastructures? Or is, or is that really genuinely the, the best way that we could educate any groups of children or anyway? I mean, I'm not sure I'm, I'm making much sense with that question, but I'm trying to say is, are we so amazed by that because it's so much better than the normal school? Mm -hmm. Or is it genuinely in absolute terms really, really good? That's a good question. I don't think I have a good answer for it yet. You were there. Um, I was there and I, I maybe though that it, it probably because of seeing that the br breaking of that yeah. structure of how a classroom is usually designed. I guess that was that was probably the, the, the first thing which kind of like jostled me and I was like, ah, oh, this is cool. This is amazing. Yeah. This is great. But maybe it wasn't something incredible as in it wasn't. It wasn't unheard of because, you know, as we said, Gabriel's yeah. doing it uh, without any direction either. I was doing stuff with my friends and we didn't have the Xenos was set up without any kind of direction, right? And in many ways, this was also a project. You know, I learned graphic designing. I learned web development. I learned yeah. how to organize huge groups of people and make them volunteer and work for, for, for a common objective. Yeah. So, you know, in many ways, um, <laughs> probably Xenos itself, the whole building development, was probably my biggest learning journey as well. Uh, more importantly than my GCSEs and A-levels, and even to some extent my degree. Yes. Because it was a learning in a whole complex, comprehensive way, wasn't it? I'm, I'm think what comes to mind now is I'm thinking of like bands and those sorts of things that kids do spontaneously and they organize and they get themselves together and they write songs and they come together and they play. Yeah. And the band is interesting because if somebody's effing it up it sounds terrible right yeah. so everyone has to but be but if everyone's playing exactly the same thing it sounds bad as well right yep. so you've got to be playing enough in harmony but also enough differently so everyone's so isn't it like a perfect model in a way for society a band all playing their own bit but it all works together like all the cells in the body all doing their own bit but it's yeah. all working together and is that not the thing that kids want to do anyway spontaneously right yeah i want to um it's kind of like when you're talking about this it's like I want you to explain a little bit more about complex systems because that's right. a super cool idea and I think it's a band, the human body, uh, kids playing together is, a, is a, an incredible analogy for that. Yeah. Okay. okay, so as I understand that and my, my knowledge on the subject is, is not super extensive, I know a fair bit about it but mm -hmm. what I want to sort of explain is the fact that there are things which exist which you can't really predict how they're going to end up going. And so if I 
explain what a complex system is by contradistinction and we'll talk about a very simple system yeah. then we'll talk about a complicated system and then we'll talk about a complex system so a simple system could be something like uh, a pencil you know it's a system it does a job it, but it's very very simple there's no real moving parts or anything like that most people could work out what's going on just very easily right a complicated system mm -hmm. could be something like a a phone um, a phone has many moving parts. It's got currents flowing in it. It's got lots of processing happening. It's got data flowing in it. So there's lots of moving parts, but there isn't anything that it does that it wasn't really designed for. It's designed to do these things. You could hack it to do certain things that it wasn't, but in essence, it processes ones and zeros and it puts it together and it gives you display and it receives input from you and it then gives out output. Um, Whereas a complex system is different. You can't really know exactly what it is and wh how it will behave by just looking at the parts. So for example, economics is a complex system. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone comes up with th these theories about how the markets are gonna work. But as soon as you put a whole bunch of humans together and all these different variables, there's just so many variables, you end up with having something which you can't predict what's gonna happen. And if you could, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. We'd be predicting and we'd be making lots of money. Yeah. So the point is, so, so economics is a great example of that, but there's many complex systems. And education is kind of, in a way, it's quite sort of a complex system because it's got all the bits that relate to all the other parts. Anything involving large numbers of humans is a complex system, yeah. really. But so we can't, if we, if we try to really improve one particular part, we won't realize all the effects of all the other things that may happen as a result of this consequence. Yeah. I mean, you see it in economics all the time, for example, well, we'll just control interest rates and we'll sort of reduce interest rates. But if you reduce interest rates, you might encourage all the people to borrow, but then a lot of people are thinking, well, hang on a sec. Um, I, I mean, obviously I don't want to save money because I'm not getting any, so I want to spend money. Yeah. And so you might think that's wonderful, but then all the people that um, have spent all their lives saving up a lot of money and to live off their sort of like their their interest suddenly they don't have a they don't have a, a a means of engaging or participating in the economy so there are unintended consequences whenever humans approach a complex system like and treat it like a complicated one and think oh we can just design this out of it so when i'm talking about designing things what i would want to do is design the system by which we presented tools by through which young people could design ways and, and, and just live and, and, and play, play music together, do stuff, cohere together around some interesting projects. So design the frameworks that could allow these complex systems to interact without knowing what's going to happen. It's almost like set up the laws of physics, if you like, for education so that these things could emerge. Because the physics, physical laws are pretty simple. Well, we don't understand them all, but they're, they're relatively so. Yet they give rise to all this majestic complexity. I mean, life is sort of a complex system in a way, isn't it? We, we don't really know what's going to happen when we put a bunch of molecules together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get really interesting things like Zubair. And sometimes, I mean, we could, we could take all the cells that comprise Zubair and spread them out all over the garden and it'd be a lot less interesting, right? It wouldn't be able to do some of these things. You couldn't pick up all those cells and predict that if we somehow put them together, we would produce yeah. something that can think and be aware. So that's kind of simple, complicated and complex. I, I like it. I, I like the progression. And I feel like often we, we kind of want, want to make complicated, complex systems just to be able to complicate, complicate it. Yeah. We just want to, we want to be able to engage with them. In many cases, we just can't. Um, Kind of pitching in my bit in um, when I was applying to study math, the one concept which really really intrigued me was chaos theory. Right. Okay. And it's all in in, yeah. sense, in essence it's, it talks about the complex system and what it means is that um, the initial conditions that you give a yeah. complex system they can lead to anything. They yeah. can lead to chaos, um, and you can never predict what's going to happen next. So a double pendulum. If yeah, you exactly. a pendulum, you can yeah, predict probably. exactly where it will be in a, in a, its position. Add another pendulum to it, and it suddenly is unpredictable. It's a chaotic system, and you can't. Where you could start it from the same position, and a little perturbation could make an yeah. incredible difference. So, 
because yeah. it's impossible to re recreate exactly the same starting conditions. I mean, mathematically it's, it is, but it's impossible really because of the just the thermal fluctuations that mean an atomic yeah, level. You, you, yeah, exactly. Too exactly. Much you can, you can and, and the point being that very, very, very tiny atomic scale differences um, da down the road lead to extraordinary differences in, in, in emergent um, behaviour. I mean, it's not that difficult to imagine when you think about what time does to uh, a journey. Let's say I'm going, I'm in a desert, mm -hmm. right? And if I go in this direction, yeah. precisely in this direction, I'm going to end up at an oasis. And, you know, I'll walk for eight hours and I'll get there. But if I'm like two degrees off out of 360, tiny difference really, imperceptible yeah. difference, after eight hours of walking, I wouldn't be anywhere near the oasis and I die. So it's the longitudinal impact of very tiny, imperceptible, almost starting condition differences that can produce even in a straightforward system. So you imagine a system with many interacting parts, each one of them on a slightly yeah. different angle, which is, you know, what's going on. Exactly. Double so pendulum is still- interesting to you. Yeah. It was, it was. And, and that analogy, I think, fits with education. And I, I, the educational system, of course, at the whole, but also at the, at the individual level, how do we work out what bit of what interaction in a classroom, in a school, in, yeah. in my life, outside, outdoors, while I was run, run or run, led, led to, to me learning something or, some, yeah, exactly. or the other? Um, and it, it, was, it was fascinating. I think the, the analogies of the complex system and chaos theory in real life. Um, but what do you think about that? What, I guess we, what we, we definitely can't do we, we know is control this complex yeah. system what can we do instead what can we do to make it better make well, life better that, that's, that's the exciting thing in a way and the challenging thing is that we know it's complex and we know we can take a snapshot of it now mm -hmm. and see what it's doing yep. um, but we can't make any predictive outcome yep. behavior uh, related sort of guesses based on that so so what does that does that mean we give up completely or do we say well given that we know that these things happen, what are the fundamental principles that we could encourage? And you're probably going to be not completely surprised by this, but I think a lot of people would be surprised by this. When I say, well, it, it actually comes down to love. Go and on. yeah, or wanna, well, well, what you need to do is you need to say, well, there's, I mean, as I define sort of love, love is this kind of magical thing, which kind of is the unifying cosmic gravity that sort of pulls everything together that makes all these things work and you could say that it's a little bit hippie but by love I mean the uh, love is that which enables choice so in a complex system what you want is more and more choices mm -hmm. and in a complicated system what you get is fewer and fewer choices yeah. so you you exactly and down. you want to do that because you want a pencil which doesn't turn into a butterfly halfway through you know <laughs> writing some notes so yeah, so so you, so you have that but i'm what i'm saying is what what would be really interesting is to say let's approach every interaction with other humans whether it's a family or in a school type setting as a one which is furthering the choices that an individual can have and in doing that so there's me and there's you and there's what you want to be able to do and the choices that you you're going to have in your life and the choices that i'm going to have in my life and also this we have a there is a betweenness yep, because the betweenness the yeah that will affect my choice that will affect your choice exactly choice that will mine. so what we want to be thinking of at this and again, it's just one lens to look at it, and there's lots of different ways of looking at it. But if you say, let's, let's approach things from, from love and say, what can we do that will further a student's ability to make choices, complete choices, and not choices within this complicated system that we say, well, you need to get a job, you need to get qualifications, to feel good about themselves, to feel good, but also to feel good about us as well, and for us to feel good about ourselves and for the relationship to be furthered. Yeah. So you've got three dynamics here. You've got you and all the all the wonderful things that you can do to further your life. You've got me, all the things that I can do to further my life, and the relationship has to be furthered as well. So, and I, I borrow a lot of this from a guy called Forrest Landry, and he's written a tremendously good book called The Imminent Metaphysics. It's beautiful, simple, but beautiful. Um, and he talks about this, this kind of way of interacting with humans. And 
I'm saying at a, some level, if education system can be designed to further the individual, but also further the person who's making the decisions, the teachers, the parents, or whatever, the leader, and further the relationship. And it's that relationship that stimulates lifelong learning and stimulates those things. Yeah. I don't get inspired by people who are really, really good at their subject if I don't also want something that they've got in their life. Right? If someone's a teacher and they sort of say, you know, oh, I mean, you could be teaching something really interesting. Like I always say, you could be teaching computer games and how to make pizzas. But if there's something about you that I, th I don't want anything, I don't want anything that that guy stands for. Yeah. I don't get behind anything that guy stands for. I'm going to be uninterested because there isn't that relationship. So it's not just empathy. It's em it's definitely empathy is a big part of it. But I want, for example. I want a teacher, I would be fascinated by anything, phenomenology or, you know, astrophysics or maybe old Latin, if the teacher themselves is so fascinated and loves it so much and they've got this energy, that not only that, but also they're a wonderful person and I want something, I want that same excitement that they've got for their subject, that I want not for this subject necessarily, but for, for life, life itself. Yeah. So that's an odd answer and that's just one way but I think if we can build into the education system the it's a very human answer I think it's 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 less about what um, <laughs> what t tools we give or what textbook we provide and more about the interactions the behaviors the energy that's being transmitted that's created, it and you know well it's I'm tr I, I'm thinking what can we do to allow the complex system that is people and learning together to flourish? Yeah. And so if you have that energy, if that's what you're going into it with and you're designing it around that energy as principles, then I think it's got a chance. If you try and, try and design it um, as a complicated thing, I think it will always, there'll always be tensions and it'll probably fall apart. I don't know. What do you think? How would you? <laughs> um, well, I, I, You've taken the human angle, so I can't really talk much more about that. Um, I was thinking about catalysts. Yeah. I was thinking about, you know, a chemical reaction it speeds up incredibly fast, and it, sometimes it's not even possible without a catalyst. Without a catalyst, yeah. you'd be dead. So, yeah. so thinking about learning as, as a complex process, mm -hmm. then what are things that we can build and create? And this is what, when yeah. it's more, more like what are very, the very, that we could yeah. Get? Yeah. What, what are the things that we can help, um, you know, know. Make, more li make education and learning more efficient, make it more, make deeper, I don't know how to, how to, how to phrase that well, but like mm. make the learning deeper so that it doesn't come at a surface level, but actually gets inside, it gets deeper inside your neuro system and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think there are lots of techniques and tools out there which allow for that. And... I didn't. I wasn't aware of this. The only thing I did know about uh, was the Pomodoro technique, and I used that quite a lot in my. I remember school, my GCSEs. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I was not not at all like. I don't think productivity was that big of a thing at the time at all. Anyway, um, but yeah, I, the only thing that I was very uh, happy with was the Pomodoro technique because one thing I was horrible with, horrible with, was um, reading my own notes. Right. I, I really disliked that. I didn't want to sit down and read those same things. Um, and I realize now that maybe reading wasn't the right thing to do at all anyway. Oh, but oh. Um, I used the Pomodoro and I used time boxes, I guess, in a more yeah. general form yeah. to help me stay motivated on certain tasks. Yes. Yeah, so so what, I guess what you're saying is there are techniques, there are specific techniques. So there's this airy-fairy metaphysical way of looking at things in a way which is, okay, let's focus on love and complex systems. And there's, well, let's give some specific tools to people yeah. and let's see what they can do with these and tools that make them feel more powerful as learners and more mm -hmm. agentic if you like so they've got more agency as a learner yeah 100 percent. i think that would be really good you know what the challenge is of course is that there's a time lag in things because most people who are teaching and teaching environments mm -hmm. will be a will have probably been quite removed from sort of the latest sort of approaches or the latest science-based researches, like anything. So yeah. Not, not un, unusual in every field, really. And so what you do find is that people can't really teach things effectively unless they're doing them. 
which is why the model for learning which takes place in the um, in the contemporary music sector so I was principal of the Academy of Contemporary Music mm -hmm. and all the tutors all the teachers there were practicing experts course, yeah. they were practicing musicians they were yeah. session musicians they were writers they were singers performers all those things and so if you're not actually doing deep no, serious yeah. learning yourself mm. how can you be teaching learning effectively that's true and so like uh, uh, to, to stay on top of the math and latest discoveries you need to be you know sitting at, at yeah. reading journals and research papers and keeping yeah. engaged with your content i think within the six months of me not or not even six months yeah. been a couple of months now of not having looked at math i i, f I feel yeah. rusty already yeah. and so i need to be continuously engaging with the content so do you think that teachers should be continuously encouraged to interact with their subjects do you think i think, I think everybody should be the example of what they want so every single human should be at the edge of learning in at least one domain or at least one in one capacity. If every parent really was working hard at learning a new language or a skill or an instrument or something, they wouldn't have to encourage their children to read. Because you'd see it. Because they would see it. If, all, if parents are just sort of sitting watching Netflix, you know, or whatever, because they're working hard and all those great things. You know, I'm not, I don't have anything against Netflix, but because this might be on Netflix. Um, you know, it's going to be harder then to convince people. It's like, you know, convincing people to do what you're not doing is kind of a hard thing. And then you start, you know, people start thinking you're a politician then. So I think being the example is probably the single most be valuable the, thing. Yeah, be the example of what you want. Like Jack Gandhi said, be the change. You know, be the, be the example of the learning that you want to, to, um, to promote. Um, and so should teachers, schools, if we still persist with schools as a model, all teachers should be paid more and should teach less so we get they enjoy their job and uh, are rewarded maybe they do have bigger class sizes a lot of evidence suggests that class size doesn't make much difference unless you go below 15 it doesn't really make much difference okay. um, so once you're above that sort of group dynamic 15 20 25 I mean China they have 60 70 kids in a class right I'm not saying that that's um, the way but Chinese teachers will teach six classes a week Six hours, oh, what, six hours, might be six, 45 minutes, might be six, hour and a half, whatever, but only six or seven hours a week. And but there's 60 or 70, so yeah. they probably have quite a bit of marking to do because they haven't got over that, that they yeah. haven't realized that that's a problem as well. But you think about how much more effective you could be if you were only, instead of teaching 20 to 25 hours a week, you were teaching six or seven hours a week. You could you produce some high quality sort of content. And then in your other time, one day a week, you could be learning. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is make it easier. So do A-level French in a week or psychology in a week or something like that, using mm -hmm. something like the learning sprint rather than trying to do the learning in the way that you've learned, which is almost certainly not going to be, I mean, you need a few other people to, to, for it to work. You need mm -hmm. to be a coherent, collaborative mm -hmm. group project type of learning yeah. um, for it to be fun and enjoyable. But you could say all the teachers in a school have got one week extra holiday and that was a learning holiday and they learned something that they've always wanted to learn and they learned it using something like the learning sprint and they smashed through and did a GCSE or an A-level or a professional qualification. Nice. How cool would that be, right? That would be really cool. That would be a good story to tell. And everyone would like to do that because yeah. it would be something that they wanted to do. Even if it's just go super deep into a book. Yeah. Uh, I on, uh, often we, we often don't find time to read especially deeper Deep. non-fiction books, you know, the ones which take time and probably need you to go back and forth a couple of times to, to really get... So if, so if we're doing civilization redesign, what you'd want to have is you would have a whole structure whereby anyone who is... It's all like a fountain, right? I think I've used this analogy before with you, you might know, but you've got, you've got the, the, the water, it's on a loop and you've got people at various stages of the fountain and you might have people who are the kind of the most advanced version of these they're, they're expert learners but you have other people who are sort of a little bit down the chain who are learning from them and learning from them and so on. so what you'd really want is that everyone was trying to learn something and everyone whether it's a parent a teacher a worker 
they were deeply connected with all other learners because they were just it might be one week a month, might be one week a year, wouldn't really matter. But that whole idea of just taking a week to just go and get deep into something. You wouldn't have any trouble at all then um, encouraging people to learn. It just would, it would be, learning would be something that you did your whole life. And it wouldn't be, oh, lifelong learners is really important. No, it's like, it would be an infrastructure to make lifelong learning happen. Yeah. And you wouldn't even have to worry about paying for it, the economics of it, because the investment in society yeah. for doing that would be massive. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe. Well, like, uh, at least in the way that it's happening nowadays with CPD and budgets and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't feel right. It feels so artificial. It feels almost like oh, we have another checkbox to fill out. Yeah. Let's do it. And teacher training is universally terrible. When you go to teacher training events, it's just like... And anyway, so, but, but, but let's not focus on the negative things. What we're talking about, complete education design as a subset of civilization. Right. So let's, let's wrap it up. Yep. By looking at the current climate, yep. looking at what's happened in the past few weeks, months, yep. uh, looking at the reset that's been hit um, and yeah. the ways, the huge challenges that have come forward, mm. you know, things like the UK A-level and GCSE exams, universities going into these incredibly tough times, drop in student recruitment. In general, the education system has like had a big shake, you know, it's like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what, what do you, I, I, I guess um, there's no are, question. Are the good things or the, what, what are you interested in? I guess the opportunities. Yeah. We know, we know there's horrible things. Yeah. We know the good things, we know the bad things. Let's look at, let's focus on what, what does this provide us as an opportunity? Yeah. Um, um, one thing it's taught me is that actually online learning can work very, very well. So recently we ran um, with the founder of uh, a system called Smart Wisdom, which is kind of a note-taking thing. We ran a pilot program with one of the, one of the better well, mo most well-known schools in Shandong in, in, in China. And the results that we got in terms of student outcomes, student outputs, were comparable at age 15, 16, 17, these students were comparable with master's level students in UK universities who are trained face to face. Wow. And that is not really necessarily, I think, um, can be isolated on one thing. It is a bit of a complex thing. Yeah. So part of it was the fact that technology is a lot better. Part of it is the fact that people's expectations for online learning is now different. Yeah. Part of it is that the, what we were training them in was something that could work really well and they could do lots of practice and all those things. So there were, there, there, there's a bunch of variables. Like in education, there's always so many variables. But I was really encouraged by the fact that online learning could genuinely work. And you sort of get, probably get a sense for how there's many efficiencies now as we realize we don't have to meet face-to-face -face with lots of people. We love meeting face-to-face. -face. It's wonderful. It's what makes us human, but there's lots of things we can do without it. And the remote working and the home working and all that sort of stuff, I think, brilliant. And that's, that's, that's a real opportunity. So in that, the education opportunity is say, OK, if we find the right kind of structures and the right, the right things themselves to be teaching, which is probably less content and probably more techniques, um, it, could be, it could be quite possible to go straight to solving SDG4 way before 2030 because what you the only the only barrier to it really is its coordination there isn't really a barrier in cost there isn't really a barrier in yeah. in infrastructure it's the just coordinate are, the, the economics of investment i mean there's lots of things which are investment but getting everybody all humans up to a stage where they can read and adequately think and process logic for themselves and learn how to learn anything new fast. That's just a no-brainer. Any country that, that thinks it's better to spend the amount of money they're spending now to take people age five, put them in a system for 12 years and have them coming out age 17, 18 with their yeah. current skill level for learning, mm -hmm. Any, any, system, any country that thinks that's a better system than, than the one we're proposing now is, is, is obviously deeply flawed in their thinking because that's a huge cost for very little output at the moment. And what yeah. we're saying is actually we could educate the whole world really, really easily. Um, and I, it could happen 
it's just a coordination problem. I mean, Zenotes could be a big part of this. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have, you know, a full stack remote school running every Monday. We start a subject, we run an entire, we could do that. We could do that. We could do that with the technology. It's right, it's right there. So that's the opportunity. That's, what, <coughs> that's what's really exciting. And can I just say that it's the, the, the environment is like really fertile for it. The, the, the approachability of people, yeah. The acceptance of online learning, and it's just—I I do want to clarify though, because for a lot of people, online learning has become a nightmare as well. So, oh, yeah. it, it's in let let's let's clarify that bit because what we when we define and describe as online learning isn't a two-hour Zoom lesson where the yeah. first fifteen minutes is about figuring out where the stylus works and how how yeah. to get screen sharing. <laughs> the other thirty minutes is trying to work out what yeah. the teacher's saying because their mic yeah. is horrible. Exactly. Um, it's when things are working. It's when technology is working with us. But it's also with incredible people. We talked a lot about love. We talked a lot about the engagement and we talked about the master cast system. We yeah. talked about how do we keep the conversation. And when we talk about online learning, we, when it's in our head, you know, we need to just make sure it's crystal clear. This is what we talk, this is what we mean. This is where we're getting incredibly passionate, engaging people with amazing people who are facilitating this kind of conversation yeah. and having you know this, inc this completely available accessible in a very very easy uh, and a very technologically sound way it's like jazz in that when i say jazz you understand something somebody else understands something completely different everyone has their own idea of what jazz is so when i say online learning you know there's some jazz which i think is the worst type of music of all and some jazz which i think is my absolute favorite kind of music it's very 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 varied so what i mean by online learning is when online learning is as good as remote work is good when it can be asynchronous but it can have collaborative groups in a real classroom or a or a home working together so you've got that you they're inspired by somebody who is a, a domain expert somebody inspirational who's really challenging them but they've got this like this really warm connection it's community it's all those wonderful things i would say that some online learning is like the worst jazz it's absolutely yeah. shocking and i i would i would rather well there's lots of things i'd rather do than put any <laughs> of my own children through that yeah. for sure so you're completely right to draw that apart. But what's really interesting is that you get these things and it's hard work for us to unpack in someone else's head what we mean by online learning yeah. because they immediately go to, you know, what they think jazz is, which is the jazz that their dad played or whatever when they were, you know. So, so I think that's important. And I'm glad you brought that up. I'm not just saying, oh, well, the current, there's lots of online learning. And, you know, 90% of most things is crap. Right? Well, maybe maybe 95 percent 95 percent most statistics are crap but but the point being that you know there will be examples of you know absolutely shocking things in every domain it's just that the best things in a lot of domains can be really good so i would say that is a coordination problem if we can if we can help with this ability to get something available affordable accessible to everybody i think the world will be a much better place and you get to live in that world and so do I and so does everyone listening. So we all, it's a big investment. Education done right is, for the last hundred years, every society has realised that education done right is the best investment. Yeah. Yeah. They've realised that. So now they just have to realise what done right looks like yeah. and we need to help them with that. So Amazing. It's cold now, isn't yeah, it? A little bit cold. <laughs> right. Let's, let's, um, really yeah, yeah, it's good. Thanks. See you in the next one.